Good morning. We welcome you to our online version of worship from the First Presbyterian Church of St. Albans, West Virginia. This worship is being live streamed on April 26, 2020, the third Sunday after Easter. We invite you to comment during our service with other worshipers with prayer needs and hallelujahs. There are other ways to contribute to our ministry, and you will find those invitations on our Facebook page and website listed at the end of the service. Sunday evening, adult Sunday school Zoom class at 6 p.m. Check your email for links to the Zoom class and the Wired Word article for preparation. Have you heard of One Hit Wonders? We have many music groups over the years who produce one great hit song and then nothing else. We have many books of the Bible which are very short, many with only one chapter, the shortest only 13 verses long. What could they say to our Christian world today? Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m., join in the adult Zoom Bible study for these one-hit wonders. Check your email for links and lessons. This coming Wednesday, April 29th at 6.30 p.m., Philemon, only 25 verses. Your session continues to watch the news and meet twice a month to make decisions about our continued work here at FPCSA. Their concern is for your safety and continued health, yet offering lessons and worship. We will continue in our online worship at least through the end of April, knowing that the West Virginia coronavirus curve is not yet flattening, which could cause us to remain apart even through May. Please help us help you in any way possible. Contact a session member or Reverend Doug if you have a need for delivery of food or other essential needs. Also during this time, since we are not physically together to take our donations and offerings, please feel free to send your offering to First Presbyterian Church St. Albans, 201 Canal Terrace, St. Albans, West Virginia, 25177. Please leave prayer concerns on our webpage or Facebook page by Thursday, 7 p.m. to be included in next Sunday's prayers. Let us worship God. Please join me in our call to worship. Followers of Jesus, by his cross we are redeemed from the futility of sin. Alleluia. By his rising, we are free from the fear of death. Alleluia. By his love, we are made new in the living and enduring word of God. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Please join us in our gathering song. You are my strength when I am weak.
please join me in our call to confession. God judges all people impartially according to their deeds. Trusting in God's love in Jesus Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us confess together in this prayer of confession. Almighty God, our world is filled with corruption. Power disguises itself as truth. Convenience masquerades as goodness. Self-pleasure imitates love. We confess to you, O oh God, that we have been caught in the web of the world's sin. By the power of the Holy Spirit, save us from these deceptions and free us for glad obedience, that we may see the joy of Jesus' resurrection and receive the promise of everlasting life. Amen. Followers of Jesus, God has promised salvation to us, to our children, and to all who are near and far. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our first scripture lesson is from Acts chapter 2, verse 14 
and verses 36 through 41 from the NRSV. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join us in our next hymn, When the Poor Ones.
Well, good morning. Glad you're here to join us at our children's message today, this Sunday in which we talk about what is happening as the church is beginning to be formed. And part of the reason it's being formed is that the Apostle Peter is telling, is reminding everyone about God's love and God's reason for bringing us together as a community, as a congregation, as a church, as a world. And he talks about how it's for the total salvation, for making things right, making things good. Not, and he's not just talking about people, he's talking about the world as well. And so how does God do that? How does God fix everything? Well, he does, God does that by showing love. And I was trying to think of ways in which I could have, give you some, uh, a way to learn that and know that. So I thought, oh, I could get a piece of rope, a piece of, of string, where Jesus talks about he is both the beginning and the end. He is the start and the final thing. And that's what connects us together. That is one way we can talk about God's love. But there's a problem, I, I think, with this being as a symbol for that, because even though it's connected between the beginning and the end, there's a piece missing. It's not, it's not right. It's not showing how God heals and holds everything. But what about a ball? Does a ball show God's love and God wanting everything to be fixed and together in one piece? Well, is there a beginning and an end to a ball? I mean, is that a beginning or is this a beginning? Where's the end if that's the beginning? Maybe, maybe... A ball is a better idea to show how God's love completes and is perfectly balanced and is all one piece. Yes, that's what Peter was trying to tell us as a, as a people of God, that God wants us to be complete and filled and formed. Ah, yes. That is what God wants. Would you pray with me? Most wonderful Lord, we thank you for your blessings, for your coming into this world to give us completeness, to heal our wounds, to make us ready and right for your love, for your hope, for your faith. It is in this we pray, amen and amen. God bless. Good morning. This is our sermon text this morning from Luke chapter 24, reading from verses 13 through 35. And this is from the New Revised Standard Version. Luke 24, beginning with verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. 
Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they came, when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with the prophets and with Moses, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we, he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Glorious Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, to be fed from your word. Fill us as the bread in this scripture, that we may be filled and full and satisfied. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Amen and amen. So, how is it possible that anyone could be so blind. You've heard all the reports, why you probably have heard firsthand from the source, not to mention all the others who have been keeping you up to date with all the reports from the past, even with those who have been sick, but now are healed. Maybe you've heard from those who have been sent away, those who have been travelers, those, those who have been on the road many days, who have seen the results from all around the country. How could you be so blind? Now, I'm not talking about the two men who were just outside the immediate circle of Jesus' disciples who were heading home to Emmaus, not sure of what the future holds. But you probably, probably thought I was that's to whom I was referring. I, I mean, they were blinded by what they had witnessed, what they expected, so much so that they couldn't recognize Jesus accompanying them on their way home. So you can understand that there are other times in which people can be so reticent to see what is right in front of them because they believe something else is true or want something else to be true. Can you think of any current situation which might be an equivalent? Where what was obvious was not, where facts were treated as mere conjecture, Untested antidotes were dreamed up as cures. Life has drastically changed, but we should act as if everything is normal. So it isn't so strange after all. 
the path and the way and the truth and are right here with us, and yet we act so surprised when the facts are laid out before us. We fail to take the path we should go down because we are so focused on the way we still intend to go. Why can't I go to the concert, the, the sports arena, the restaurant, the school? What's all the fuss? I don't believe in this invisible thing every, everyone is talking about. So why should I let it bother me? That's their problem. It's nothing but a flu. It'll be over by April. I prophesy that by next Sunday, there will be more Americans who will be dead after two months with this coronavirus than were killed in 10 years of the Vietnam War. And in the fall, without a vaccine and with COVID deaths intermingled with those of the flu, we may approach the number of American dead of World War II. But we were so hopeful. We were so looking for a different ending. Just like these two disheartened, distraught disciples, we were anticipating a miraculous, marvelous escape. And we aren't home yet. Oh, don't get me wrong, I, I know you are home. We are all home. But we aren't where we should be or will be. And we will never be in our normal home again. I mean, don't you feel like you are in between? You haven't finished your journey? but you can't be on the road. And even if you were out traveling, is your next stop safe? Is your destination clear? Why are you here today? Why are you here watching and listening and participating in worship right now? Is it because this has is habit or even though we're in our own separate homes? I'm really hoping that the real reason that we are worshiping together this morning is to praise God, as we have been commanded, as we have been loved into doing. I am hoping that we are gathered in the communion of fellowship to share God's fruits that have been born upon our branches. First, I don't think that God really cares what reason brought you here. Secondly, I think it is interesting that although we are scattered all over, we still are gathered together now. These two disciples who had actually left town, they, they were broken with the rest of the disciples. They had scattered from the center of the group to head toward their home in Emmaus to what they knew. But what was to happen to them soon was to happen to many this day. Throughout that country, the city, and even in the cemetery, Jesus was to be seen. Like many others who were to see Jesus, the two going to Emmaus did not at first recognize this man as Jesus. As Mary, who at the tomb thought Jesus was a gardener, these two would not recognize him until he did something that was familiar. To the two disciples of Emmaus, it was the manner in which Jesus broke, blessed, and gave them the bread. The way in which this was done evoked such strong emotions and memories. This is Jesus, the Christ. These two disciples who were scattered, who were separate, who were getting a new vision of Jesus' might and power, and a new understanding of Jesus' and who he really was. He wasn't just a carpenter's son, not just a prophet, but the Messiah, the Savior who was promised from long ago. The two disciples in Emmaus had finally recognized Jesus. It was this new understanding that they took back with them as they retraced their steps to Jerusalem and to the other disciples. Yes. Back they went to be with the others. 
They had to give them the news of their sighting of the risen Christ. They had to tell the disciples who were trapped in the upper room that the days of hiding were numbered. When they did reach that Jerusalem room, they heard others telling their stories of meeting Christ. They were not the only ones who had discovered this truth. Their witness was added to the Shekinah of the glory of the resurrection, which was promised to all. It is here, gathered together, that we too can share how we saw the Christ. How together we recognize Christ. It is through worshiping together that we learn of Christ and Christ's command to go tell others. That is our commission. We come together to share our stories. Then we are scattered to spread the good news. Let us see that upon our return, return to normal life, that the fire is still in our hearts and that we shall be able to share Christ's recognition with each other. There still are many who don't see God because God is invisible. Invisible until seen in our faith and our action, in our reaching out, even while being obedient now by staying in. Though scattered, we will return. And this return will give us new insight, new words to take in. And in our future, when we can again gather in person, it'll no longer be understood as normal. And our departing worship will be different too. It will be. It will look forward to that day, the day we wish to have more to share with others of the world and the work and the word of Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in reciting together the Apostles' Creed, saying what we believe? Let us confess our faith as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join together now in our prayer to God with prayers from this congregation. Hear, O Lord, the prayers of your people. We pray for the many people today, those in our own congregation and those outside of it, those in St. Albans and those in the whole world. We pray for those who are especially in the throes of fighting the disease of COVID-19 and all other ills and disasters and needs. We pray for those who are struggling with their health. We pray for all those who, on the medical side, are bringing the healing, offering comfort. Return them to your protection, Lord. We are appreciative of those who are seeking the best for your people. Return them to your protection. We pray for Jeannie Young's niece, Tammy, and her family on the death of her husband, Paul, who died suddenly last Friday. We seek prayers for their comfort, especially that they can come to know and be comforted in the hope of our Christ's resurrection. We pray for Muriel Frankie, who is 
worried about her employees of the nursing home in which she lives. She said they seem so overworked and frazzled. Please watch over her. We continue in prayer for Carol Olberg, who's lost her eldest son to COVID almost on the anniversary of her husband's death. Keep her in your continued prayers, Lord. We are grateful that although Karen Lamb has tested positive for COVID, so far she continues to eat and breathe and is doing okay. And that others at Riverside, like our, uh, our own Georgiana Hager, is also still clear of COVID and doing well. We pray for all their caregivers and their protection. Our prayers go out to all who watch over the care of others, as parents, as teachers, and those of us who now care for our own elderly parents or extended families. Help each of us who must have multiple roles of teachers and helpers and providers and cooks. We pray for all those who have been dealing with previous accidents and dealing with other health issues and still must uh, seeking your healing and health. And so we pray for Peggy Young and Carol Buck and Pebble Post, who is doing much better and is grateful for the prayers she has received. We are thankful for our leaders like Governor Justice, who are doing the best for their constituents, for increasing testing, for closing schools and businesses, and for keeping us all safer at home. We implore you, dear God, to hear our request for speedy answers and vaccines, to to give your people a way to show others of your rescue that you will offer the world, that this COVID-19 cannot stand. If we need to behave, Lord, if we need to change, if we need to alter our prayers or actions or faith, show us the way. Lord, give us your directions. We pray for your continued presence in our lives. We ask you as our Savior and guide to strengthen our belief to see that you are in the heroics of the helpers, that you are in the salvation of those who deliver. Bring your spirit upon our lungs and our hearts that we might see and believe with faith, recognizing your presence and understanding your place in our lives. We pray this in the name of our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Receive this blessing, our benediction. 
May the grace of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, the love of God who raised him from the dead, and the power of the Holy Spirit who fills the world with new life, bless and keep you. Amen and amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may he hold you in his hand. May God hold you in the Oh, do you?